All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we're going to look at another sutra. So um, tonight we're going to still we're going to still spend a little bit of time in the middle length discourses. So the Majima Nikaya. Uh, tonight we're going to be discussing Sutta number thirty seven. The Chula Tanha Samkhya Sutta, the shorter discourse on the destruction of craving. So that's what we're going to discuss tonight is the destruction of craving, the destruction of Tanha. Um, uh, let me give you a few kind of a little bit of background information on this sutra. Um, just a couple of things. Um yeah, and then we'll start reading it and discussing it. So really quickly, and I, I didn't mention this the last few Dharma doors. So we've been spending a lot of time in the, the suttas that are in the Majima Nikaya. And we are in a section of the Majima Nikaya, and it's called the division or the section of pairs. And the reason why that's called that is because all of the sutras in this particular little collection, there's a little version and a big version, a chula version and a maha version of, of all of these sutras, but they're not connected. They're just, I mean, they're connected in that there is, for example, tonight, we're discussing the shorter discourse on destruction of craving. And then there's a longer discourse on the destruction of craving that we're going to talk about next week. But besides the topic of the destruction of craving, there's really no nothing connecting the two. It just so happens that they're grouped together in this section on pairs. So that's sort of about the where this sutra fits into the larger kind of collection. Now... What we're going to talk about tonight is, well, actually, we're going to kind of talk about two things tonight. This sutra, which is a pretty short sutra, it's really only like four, four pages or so. There's the teaching. There's like kind of what, well, there's the teaching on the destruction of craving. So there's the teaching and then there's the kind of the story or the sutra that encompasses this teaching. And I kind of want to tonight, I kind of want to talk about them in those two different ways where on the one hand, there's just what is the information that's being conveyed here, which is about destroying craving. But then there's this kind of going to be this whole story about well, about one of our monks. And so I kind of want to spend tonight, want to spend half of our time talking about the message, talking about the teaching. And then I do want to kind of address the interesting story where this teaching is found. Um, Yeah, and there's a bunch of things that I want to say about, about the topic tonight, tanha, craving. Um, but let me... Yeah, before kind of time gets away from me in that way, let's go ahead and read it, or at least maybe we should just read the beginning. <clears throat> yeah, let's just read the beginning and then we'll have a nice conversation about the teaching and then I'll read the end of the sutra. So just to give us something to discuss, ah, what page we, I'm on page 344 of the wisdom publication translation. Unfortunately, by the way, uh, Noe was kind enough to put a link to a version of the sutra online. Unfortunately, I couldn't find this version online. So if you're using the link that was provided in the chat, you're going to notice some differences in the language, but it's a pretty straightforward sutra. So, you know, the, the translation doesn't matter that much for this particular one. So. <clears throat> Here we go with our Chula Tanha Samkhya Sutra, <clears throat> this shorter discourse on the destruction of craving. 
thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Migara's mother. Then Chakra, ruler of the gods, went to see the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, he stood at one side and asked, Venerable Sir, how in brief is a bhikkhu, a practitioner, how in brief is a bhikkhu liberated in the destruction of craving? One who has reached the ultimate end, the ultimate security from bondage, the ultimate holy life the ultimate goal, one who is foremost among gods and humans. The Buddha replies, Hear, O ruler of the gods, a bhikkhu has heard that nothing is worth adhering to. When a bhikkhu has heard that nothing is worth adhering to, they directly know everything. Having directly known everything, they fully understand everything. Having fully understood everything, whatever feeling or sensation that they feel, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, the bhikkhu abides contemplating the impermanence of those sensations, contemplating their fading away, contemplating their cessation, contemplating relinquishment. Contemplating thus, one does not cling to anything in the world. When one does not cling, one is not agitated. When one is not agitated, one personally attains nirvana. They understand. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming to any state of being. Briefly, it is in this way, O ruler of the gods, that a bhikkhu is liberated in the destruction of craving, one who has reached the ultimate end, the ultimate security from bondage, the ultimate holy life, the ultimate goal, one who is foremost among gods and humans. Then, just to give you a little context of where this is going, so then, having heard the teaching, Chakra, ruler of the gods, delighted and rejoicing in the Blessed One words, paid homage to the Blessed One, and keeping the Blessed One on his right, he vanished at once. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Maha Magolyana was sitting not far from the Blessed One. And Madhugayana considered, did that spirit chakra penetrate to the meaning of the Blessed One's words when he rejoiced, or did he not? Suppose I find out whether he did or not. Then, just as quickly as a strong man might extend and flex his arm, the Venerable Maha Madhugayana vanished from the palace of Megara's mother in the eastern park and appeared amongst the gods of the 33 levels of heaven. Now on that occasion, Chakra, ruler of the gods, was furnished and endowed a hundredfold with the five kinds of heavenly music, and he was enjoying it in the pleasure park of the single lotus flower. When he saw the venerable Maha Magulyayana coming in the distance, he dismissed the music, went to the venerable Maha Magulyana and said to him, 
Come, good sir. Come, Magulyayana. Welcome, Magulyayana. It's long, good sir, Magulyayana, since you found an opportunity to come up to heaven and see me. Sit down. Sit down, good Magulyayana. This seat is ready for you. Then the venerable Maha Magulyana sat down on the seat made ready, and Chakra took a low seat and sat down at one side. The venerable Maha Magulyana then asked him, Koshiya, a nickname for Shakya, Koshiya, how did the Blessed One state to you in brief deliverance in the destruction of craving? It would be good if we might also get to hear that statement. And Shakya replied, Good sir, Magulyana, we are, we are so busy. We've got a lot to do, not only with our own business, but also with the business of the other gods of the 33 levels of heaven. Besides, good sir, Magulyana, what is well heard, well learned, well attended to, well remembered, ah, it suddenly vanishes from us. Good Sir Magulyayana, it once happened that war broke out between the Devas and the Asuras. In that war, the Devas won and the Asuras were defeated. When I'd won that war and returned from it as a conqueror, I had the Vijanta Palace built. Good Sir Magulyana, the Vijanta Palace has a hundred towers, and each tower has seven hundred upper chambers, and each upper chamber has seven nymphs, <laughs> and each of those nymphs has seven maids. Would you like to see the loveliness of the Vijanta Palace, good sir, Magulyana? And the venerable Maha Magulyana consented in silence. Then Shakya, ruler of the gods, and the divine king Vashavana went to the Vijanta palace, giving precedence to Mahamogulyana. When the maids of Shakya, the ruler of the gods, when they saw the venerable Mahamogulyana coming in the distance, they were embarrassed and ashamed, and they each went into their own rooms just as a daughter-in-law is embarrassed and ashamed on seeing her father-in-law, so too when the maids of Shakya saw the venerable Mahamogulyana, they were embarrassed and ashamed and they went each into their own rooms. Then Shakya, ruler of the gods, and the divine king Vashavana had the venerable Mahamogulyana walk all over and explore the Vijanta palace. See, good Magulyana, the, this loveliness of the Vijanta Palace. See, good Sir Magulyana, this loveliness of the Vijanta Palace. Magulyana said, It does the Venerable Koshiya credit as one who has formerly made merit. And whenever human beings see anything lovely, they always say, My God! Or they always say, Sirs, it does credit to the gods of the 33. It does the venerable Koshiya credit as one who has formerly made merit. Then the venerable Maha Magulyana considered thus. This spirit, Chakra, is living way too negligently. What if I stirred up a sense of urgency in him? Then the Venerable Mahamagulyana performed such a feat of supernormal power that with his toe, he made the Vajranta palace shake and quake and tremble. Chakra and the Divine King Vasavana and the gods of the 33 were all filled with wonder and amazement. And they said, Sirs, it is wonderful. It's marvelous what power and might this recluse has, that with his, pig, with his big toe, he makes the heavenly abode shake and quake and tremble. 
when the venerable Mahamagulyana knew that Chakra, ruler of the gods, was stirred to a sense of urgency with his hair standing on end, he asked him, Koshiya, how did the Blessed One state to you in brief deliverance from the destruction of craving or deliverance in the destruction of craving? It would be good if we might also get to hear that statement from you. Good sir, Magulyana, I went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, I stood to one side, and I said to him, Venerable Sir, how in brief is a bhikkhu liberated in this, the destruction of craving? How are they one who has reached the ultimate end, the ultimate security from bondage, the ultimate holy life, the ultimate goal? How are they one who is foremost among gods and humans? When this was said, good sir Magulyana, the Blessed One told me, Here, O ruler of gods, a bhikkhu has heard that nothing is worth adhering to. When a bhikkhu has heard that nothing is worth adhering to, they directly know everything. Having directly known everything, they fully understand everything. Having fully understood everything, whatever feeling that they feel, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, they abide contemplating the impermanence of those feelings, contemplating their fading away, contemplating their cessation, contemplating relinquishment, contemplating thus, one does not cling to anything in the world. When one does not cling, they are not agitated. When one is not agitated, they personally attain nirvana. They understand. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming into any state of being. That's how the Blessed One stated to me in brief, deliverance in the destruction of craving, good sir, Magulyana. Then the venerable Mahamagulyana delighted and rejoiced in the words of Chakra, ruler of the gods. Then, just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flexed arm or flex his extended arm, Magulyana vanished from among the gods of the 33 and reappeared back in the eastern park in the palace of Migara's mother. All right, let's pause there. Yeah, let's pause there. Basically what happens at that point is Magulyana reports back to the Buddha everything that just happened up in heaven with Chakra and the words are approved. I'll read that at the end if we have time, but I kind of want to get to the teaching and then also kind of discuss this interesting kind of drama with Magulyana going up to heaven. So let's kind of just start with the basic kind of framework. So this is another one of those interesting sutras where God <laughs> comes and asks the Buddha a question. And I, I, I've mentioned this every time we talk about chakra. But I kind of want to remind everybody that that the that chakra is the the head deva, but and that word deva is where we get the well, it's where the word Zeus comes from, first of all. So Zeus is chakra. So the Greek highest god is the same thunderbolt wielding God as Indra. But then that idea of Deva being Zeus, which is where we get the Latin Deus, the Latin word for God. <laughs> so my point is, is that this idea of the highest God, well, in some traditions, that's called, you know, Yahweh. In some traditions, it's called Allah. In some traditions, it's called Zeus. 
And in the Indian pantheon, the highest of the devas, the highest of the gods is chakra. So it's incredibly significant to have a religion, <laughs> meaning this thing called Buddhism, it's incredibly significant that in this tradition, God comes and talks and asks a human being or a Buddha, comes and asks the Buddha questions, not a human being praying and bowing to chakra God. That is a very interesting role reversal. So I just want to remind everybody of that. Again, just to remind you that Chakra Indra is this kind of highest god. It gets mentioned a few times, so I'll, I'll clarify it. You know, in the Buddhist cosmology, there's this giant mountain in the middle of the world, Mount Maru. It's like, you know, way bigger than Mount Everest. It's, it's the biggest mountain in the world. And this kind of axis mundi center of the world well all along its slopes going up to its highest point are these 33 levels of heaven and it basically keeps getting more purified and more divine as you go up and at the very top of mount maru chakra indra lord of the gods has his palace and that's where he kind of is the lord or the king of all these other gods so that god comes down to a monastery or comes down to a vihara comes down to this um palace of migara's mother which is one of the places where the buddha would hang out and chakra asks the buddha basically how do you get enlightened? What does it mean for somebody to be enlightened? Now, the technical language that Chakra uses is he asks how, in brief, because Chakra, as Chakra says, he's got business to do. He's got things to attend to. So in brief, Buddha, how is a bhikkhu, a practitioner, liberated in the destruction of craving? And that's where the title of the sutra comes from. It's this idea of tanha samkhya. So the samkhya, the eradication or destruction of tanha. So chakra asks, how in brief is a bhikkhu, how do they become liberated by destroying tanha? And if they do that, they're somebody who has reached the end. The, they've reached ultimate security from bandha, from bondage. That they have achieved this ultimate holy life, the ultimate goal. And by reaching such an ultimate goal, they are considered foremost among humans and gods. So that's what Chakra wants to know, is how does a bhikkhu do that? And let's kind of go through the Buddha's response, even though we've already done it twice, it doesn't hurt to do it one more time. So the Buddha responds by basically saying that somebody, a bhikkhu, but it's a practitioner. So somebody hears that there's nothing in the world worth adhering to. Now, this language, we have a, a little bit of language to deal with tonight. I kind of want to focus, I guess, on like three different ideas, maybe four. But so here we have this idea of adhering to. And this idea of adhering to is the is the classic idea of, you know, Buddhist idea of grasping clinging technical word for these ideas is upadana appropriation but again grasping clinging so there's that idea 
And here, the Buddha is talking about that somebody, a bhikkhu, might hear, probably from the Buddha, they might hear that there's nothing that's worth adhering to. And when they've heard that there's nothing worth adhering to, they directly know everything. And having directly known everything, they fully understand everything, and having fully understood everything, then whatever feeling that they feel, whether it's painful or pleasant, or neither painful nor pleasant, they abide contemplating that feeling as being impermanent, fading away, coming to cessation, and then ultimately arriving at a state of relinquishing that. So what I want to walk us through is, I want to walk us through this idea of hearing that there's nothing in the world worth adhering to or clinging to. So in, to put this kind of very simply, because I know that every most of you out there are regular Dharma doors attendees, you know all about the basics of Buddhism, but what I kind of want to get to, to what I would like us to think about going into this, we want to be thinking about a situation where, you know, and it might be that the situation has nothing to do with us. It might be that the situation is very, what, what we consider to be very trivial. But what I'm getting at is, is I, I would like you to think about a situation in which there's like, you know, Maybe it's a contest or a race, or maybe it's a whatever it is. But I want you to think about a situation in which there's two kind of differing opinions or two differing competing parties. And I want you to think about a situation in where you don't care one way or the other about who wins that race or whatever that is again because it either doesn't concern you or it's just trivial i want you to feel the kind of lack of adhering that you might have to that like i'm i'm thinking about like a country that like a, a the presidential race of a country you've never heard of so it's a country you've never even heard of You've never heard of the, the people who are running for the office, and you don't know either of them. Do you, do you, are you like invested in who wins that presidential race? Now, you, you could become invested in that. Of course, you could. But I'm talking about right now, where you're hearing about it for the first time, and you don't have a clinging, adhering attachment to this person winning or this person winning. I want you to kind of feel that you could call it apathy, an apathos, right? Not having a feeling in that way. But again, I just want you to notice that lack of adherence and that lack of whatever, right? So it might be that there's a, oh, it might be that there's a pre presidential race in your country where you do know about the participants and you do have a vested adherence or attachment to one or the other. Feel that, feel that for a moment. <laughs> feel how that feels to like be attached to one and not the other. I lay this out, not because I want to talk about politics, but I lay this out because I want us to feel these two different kind of emotional pullings or lack of pulling, where maybe in one case where we are adhering and invested and clinging, there's a way in which we have this kind of emotional pulling. Whereas in the other one where I don't even know what country that is, I'm utterly neutral. That's what I kind of want us to, to look at right here. Now, the Buddha is suggesting in the sutra that a bhikkhu, a practitioner, they might hear that 
there's nothing worth adhering to. And if somebody hears that there's nothing worth adhering to, they directly know everything. And having directly known everything, they fully understand everything. Now, how do we get, how do we get from not adhering to anything to knowing everything and therefore understanding everything? Well, we kind of want to basically be thinking about, well, again, I'm going to kind of keep relying on this example that I've set up. The example where we are not adhering to the candidates and the example where we are adhering to a candidate against another candidate, right? So that, meaning having an adherence, there is not equanimity in that. There's not equality in that because we want this person to win or we think this person is better or whatever it is, but there's not equanimity in that. There is actually equanimity in the version where I don't even know where the country is because I am equally indifferent to either of those candidates. What I'm getting at is, is that there's a way in which when we are not equanimous in that way, there's a way in which when we are adhering to this one and therefore sort of pushing that one away, we don't know either of them. We don't really know the one that we're clinging to because we're clinging to it. And we really don't know the other one because we're pushing it away. And so even though you would think that you know the one that you're clinging to because it's like, no, because it's like, it's my candidate. I know where he was born. I know this. I know his track record. I know everything about him. I just know that guy's a jerk. That other guy's a jerk. But this guy, I know all about him. It might seem like you know everything about this one. But in a way, what kind of one way to interpret this is the Buddha saying, but when you're adhering in that sense, you actually don't know either of them. But if you hear that there's nothing worth adhering to in that way, and you kind of loosen that grip on this one, which then loosens the aversion to that one, if you can do that, then the Buddha is suggesting that by knowing there's nothing worth adhering to, you directly know everything and understand everything. And having fully understood everything, so now having fully understood everything, whatever the practitioner senses or feels, whether it's painful or pleasant or, or neither, they abide contemplating the impermanence of those feelings. Contemplating their fading away, contemplating their cessation, contemplating relinquishment. So let me walk you through that part of it. So the idea, of course, and there's a lot going on here, but normally, <laughs> normally, when a sensation arises, the mind deduces whether it's a pleasant or a painful sensation. Let's just kind of put to the side the idea of neutral sensations right now, the whole neither pleasant nor painful. Let's just put that over here for right now. A sensation arises and it's either like, ooh, that feels good. Don't stop, <laughs> right? Like if it's if it's a hot shower, I don't want to get out of the hot shower. If it's a yummy meal, I'll keep eating even though I'm full because it tastes good. But the idea is, is that when there's pleasure involved, there's this desire for it to, you know, keep going in that way. When there's a painful sensation, there's this desperate desire to get rid of it and like to just push it quickly away. 
those two movements in that sense are not what is being suggested here, which is that a practitioner who knows there's nothing worth adhering to and therefore knows everything and understands everything, when a sensation arises, the practitioner, they contemplate how this feeling, whether it's a yummy, pleasant one or a nasty, bad one, the practitioner contemplates how this is an impermanent sensation. This sensation is not going to last because no sensation just sticks around and lasts forever. Fortunately, even the painful ones are always changing and moving in that way. They don't stick around. But notice how the mind clinging to and obsessing about maybe like a pain holds on to that pain, obsesses with the pain, and therefore, in a way, is perpetuating it. Also notice on the flip side, if a pleasant feeling comes my way, there is pleasure. And there can be the experience of pleasure. There can be the observation that this is pleasurable. But what I want you to notice is, is that when the pleasurable thing arises, if there's a clinging to it, it's like, oh, yeah. Then when the inevitable disappearance of that sensation comes along, there's going to be anguish because of the loss of that. Whereas if there's just the experience of the pleasure and not a clinging to it, then when it fades away, there won't be that lingering anguish from having lost it. So we're beginning to notice sort of this interesting role of clinging in a lot of this. So then contemplating thus in the way that we just talked about, one doesn't cling to anything in the world. And when one doesn't cling, one's not agitated. That is the noble truth. Meaning that is the four noble truths, or at least that's the first, second, and third noble truth right there. When one doesn't cling, one's not agitated. That's it. That's the Dharma, folks. It's that simple. Marnie, question, comment, idea? Hey, yeah, hey. actually, um, I, I, that is you and everyone tonight. There is a paragraph uh, in the 12 and 12 on page 112 that says, uh, how shall we come to terms with seeming failure or success can we now accept and adjust either without despair or pride can we accept poverty sickness loneliness and bereavement with courage and serenity can we steadfastly content ourselves with the humbler yet sometimes more durable satisfaction satisfactions when the brighter more glittering achievements are denied us i literally feel like you just said the same thing hmm? Yep, wisdom is wisdom is wisdom. I, I, I literally was like, oh my gosh! I think <laughs> it's not, it's not only equanimity; it's this. Uh, life is lifey. Oh God, that sounds so cheesy. But <laughs> I, <laughs> am I, know, I wrong? It, it starts happening. Yeah, I know. These, these it, cliches start to it come up. It is what it is. It is what it is. I, everything is everything. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Marnie. Excellent. Any other questions or comments uh, from what we've read so far? Cool. So, well, okay. I don't want to miss it. And I don't want to miss something here. There's something really important that I want to say. And in my notes, I wasn't going to say this till the end, but I want to say it now. Um, because if I don't, 
I'll again, I'll miss this opportunity. So I want to remind everybody that the Majjhima Nikaya, this collection of suttas, I want to remind you that these are some of the earliest, oldest teachings of Buddhism, right? And they are especially this particular collection, meaning this particular order, these particular sutras, you know, these come from a, a particular school of Buddhism. And that particular school of Buddhism, the Theravada school, is, you know, very old, very conservative, and it is not Mahayana Buddhism, the more kind of mainstream, mainline type of Buddhism that, you know, includes Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, all different forms of Buddhism that you're probably aware of. They're all Mahayana and the Mahayana, that, um, and you might also kind of know that, of course, as the Bodhisattva tradition, the Bodhisattva path. So the Bodhisattva path and the Bodhisattva and the Mahayana tradition that represents the Bodhisattva, they actually kind of have a problem with the teachings of this sutra. And what I mean by that is, and actually, it's not even about the teachings of this sutra. The Mahayana has a little bit of an issue, so to speak, with the earlier teachings that you might know of as the Hinayana versus the Mahayana. And the basic teaching that is kind of problematic is this well, I used the term earlier, so I'll use it again. This prescription of apathy. So I don't want to like get it confused. They're, they're suggesting apathy. They are. <laughs> and what I would like everybody to recognize is the absolute truth, <laughs> the Dharma, which is that your your concerns are your concerns. But the point is, is that we are agitating ourselves with our concerns and nobody's doing it to us. And the litmus test or a way to kind of analyze this is to just for a moment, really kind of just, just for a moment, put on the not adhering to anything in the world. I mean, just for a moment, don't care about anything. And I know that that sounds irresponsible, but it's only right now to really get us to notice that, oh, it's because I care about that. That's why I'm agitated. And it's about recognizing that if you didn't care about that thing, you wouldn't be agitated. It's that simple. In the early Buddhist tradition, because of this wisdom about how clinging leads to agitation, the prescription was, don't cling to anything then. Don't adhere to anything. Now, what happens is, is that if one successfully attains such a state of nirvana, and that's exactly what nirvana is, that state in which all concern, care, worry, agitation, anxiety, stress, it's all gone because I'm done, as they say. What had to be done has been done. The holy life has been lived. I don't have any more dogs in this race. The problem of that from a Mahayana point of view is that the arahat, the person that achieves this state, they just stop. And the, and the reason why I'm frozen like this right now is because I just want you to kind of feel or notice or just think about 
of what service or of what help am I to all of you if I'm just stopped? What can happen is, is that you could, you could walk by me and you could be like, wow, he's so stopped. <laughs> wow, he's so still. He doesn't look like he is worrying about anything. That's like the most I could do for you at that point is just kind of be a, a role model of stillness in that way. And indeed, Marty, oh, Marty, I do not want to make, I do not want this message to get confused. It would be, the world would be a much better place if we all stopped. <laughs> Absolutely, Marty. It is, it, we are not harming we're not lying, we're not cheating, we're not stealing, we're not killing. We are just arguably just being in that way. So yeah, Marty, I do not want to disparage the monastic path or Hinayana, Theravada. It's not about that. What it's about, though, is might there be something even better than just stopping and ending my suffering. And that's where we are introduced to the Bodhisattva path. So the Bodhisattva path is the path about what is called universal awakening. Not just my liberation. All sentient beings liberation. And the thing about that, and this is what I wanted to share with everybody. Um, so actually, I'm going to do this a different way. So because of the time, I don't want to miss my opportunity also to talk about the really kind of funny story. So I'm going to get back to the Bodhisattva in just a second. But so this funny story about god chakra coming and asking the buddha what does it mean to be enlightened and the buddha saying well when one doesn't cling one's not agitated chakra says wonderful and goes back to his heavenly palace magulyayana is like did chakra did did chakra really understand what the buddha said i'm going to go find out and so Magulyana goes up to heaven to see God, to see Chakra, and says, you were, you were just down talking to the Buddha. What, what did he say again? <laughs> and Chakra basically says, I forgot. I'm so busy, I forgot. But one of the, I, th I think that this is so funny. When I, when I read this, uh, whatever, a couple of weeks ago, I started laughing. Because Chakra is basically like, ah, yeah, I, I forgot what the Buddha said. You want to see my cool palace? <laughs> you, you want to see my cool stuff? And Magulayana is basically, because he consents in silence, Magulayana is basically like, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll go see your, your palace. And, you know, Chakra's like, wow, it's got a hundred stories. And in each story, there's all these, you know, people singing. And isn't it beautiful? And Magulyayana, and what it says is, it says that um, Magulyayana, thinking about Chakra, he says, wow, this, this guy, this spirit is living way too negligently. What if I stirred up a sense of urgency in him? And that's when Magulyayana touches his big toe to the ground and shakes Indra or Chakra's palace, right? And all of a sudden, everybody perks up, right? So really quickly, and this is... This is a little technical, but I know some of you really like this out there. So back in the days, uh, last year, we were reading from the Samyutta Nikaya, the, co the connected discourses of the Buddha. And there's a section in here that we didn't talk about um, 
I was going to do a whole series on it. I might do a whole series in the future, but there's a whole section in here, way in the back. It's section 51, way in the back. And there's a little collection of suttas in here. And that collection is called the Riddhipada, the Riddhipada Samyutta. So the Riddhipada is the the pada, the steps or the path to achieving the riddhis. And the riddhis are the superpowers, the supernatural powers, right? And so this little tiny section, I think there's about 11, 12, 14 little suttas. These are all suttas that are about how to cultivate and achieve supernatural powers. There's a bunch of sutras that I really like in this section. One of them is called Shaking the Mansion. And I tell you about it because in that one, which is, uh, it's on page 1726, if you have the Wisdom Publication Edition, in that there's a bunch of uh, kind of like they sound like um, kind of like frat frat boy monks that have all been living in this uh, brick in this brick house. I think it's the brick house, but they've all been living together. And the basic idea is is that the monks that are living in this house, they've all grown kind of lazy. And what happens is is that the I think it's the Buddha that tells Madhulyayana. You should go over there and stir up a sense of urgency in the monks. And what does Madhulyayana do in this? He touches his big toe to the ground and shakes the mansion. That's the title of the sutra, Shaking the Mansion. And of course, all of the monks in the house basically think it's an earthquake. And they come running out only to realize that it was Magulyayana that had shaken the mansion. And at that, they all of a sudden, they want to learn the Dharma all of a sudden. So the first thing that I'm basically saying is that, that, is that this is kind of a trope, if you will. It's a, a recurring theme. And it's usually Magulyayana who touches his big toe and causes this kind of quaking. So... Obviously, we heard the exact same thing happen in the sutra tonight, but it's Indra's palace, which, by the way, is an even crazier thing to say <laughs> that he that he went up and but, but I didn't I didn't tell you about it. There's a whole giant backstory to this. Uh, what's it called? The. The name of his palace, the the Vijayanta palace. There's a whole big backstory to this palace. And it was, as Indra says, it was after he defeated the Asuras and he got, um, he's this, uh, he's a God of machinery. I forget his name. He's a Hindu or an Indian God of machinery. And Indra has him build him this huge palace and he keeps having him remake it and remake it until it's just perfect. My point is, if you knew the whole backstory to this palace, for a monk to come and basically shake it is saying a lot in that way. It's a huge statement to say that the supernatural powers of a meditating monk rattle the palaces of God. That's a, that's a big statement. So I wanted to share that with you, but then I also kind of wanted to tie this together really quickly. The whole idea of stirring up a sense of urgency is it's the early Buddhist version, meaning the Hinayana Nikaya version of upaya. Basically what Magulyana is doing by causing these miracles, it is 
in upaya. And it's described as an upaya, as an expedient means to like, again, to stir up a sense of urgency. Before I forget, I do want to remind you that there's another famous sutra that involves somebody's big toe touching the ground. And that's in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which is a Mahayana Buddha Sutra. And in that, it is also a form of upaya. It is also a miracle that kind of gets everybody excited. But it's not that the earthquakes exactly. In the Vimalakirti Sutra, when the Buddha touches his big toe to the ground, the whole kind of universe turns into a pure land. And everybody can see the pure land that they are already in. And then when the Buddha lifts his toe up, the world goes right back to the way it was. So this is a theme, and I just kind of wanted to connect all of those dots in that theme there. But let's go back. <clears throat> this section, still in the Samyutta Nikaya, this section on the Riddhipada, again, the steps, the pada, to attaining the riddhis, the spiritual superpowers. Basically, if I could summarize it for you, the riddhipada is a four-step practice. And the four steps to developing supernatural powers, as outlined in the riddhipada, is the first is an intense focus on chanda or chandra, desire. The second is an intense focus on virya or energy. The third is an intense meditative focus on chitta or the mind. And then the fourth is an intense focus or concentration on what is called vimamsa, but it's investigation, a kind of a form of vipassana, basically. Now, the idea here is, and this is what I wanted to share with everybody really quickly from this section. There's another sutra in the Riddhipada section that I really like. I think it's called the Brahman Yeah, I won't be able to find it, so I'm just going to paraphrase it for you here. All right, it's the it's the fifteenth sutra in this section. It's called the Brahman Unabhaha. So, just in case anybody has it, it's that little sutra there, the Brahman. And in this, it's a fascinating, very, 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 very important sutra, I think, because it's a, it's a discussion between Ananda and this Brahman about Chandra, desire, not Tanha, not craving, desire. And in the sutra, what comes up is, is that in the Riddhipada, in the path to developing the spiritual powers, you use Chandra. You focus on desire and you use desire in order to become liberated. And the Brahmin in this sutra knows that liberation for a Buddhist, means not having any more desire. And so the Brahman says this, how can you get rid of desire with desire? It's a really important question that I get asked it a lot as a Buddhist teacher, and I think many Dharma students or students of Dharma have that question. And what's interesting is Ananda gives this really great example or answer. So the Brahmin and Ananda, they meet in a park. 
And Ananda says, this morning when you were at home, did you want to come to the park to see me to talk about the Dharma? Did you have a desire to do that? Did you have a Chandra to do that? And the Brahmin says, yeah, I, I did desire to do that. And Ananda says, okay, now that you're in the park with me and we're discussing the Dharma, do you still desire going to the park? And the Brahmin says, well, no, because I'm in the park. And Ananda basically says, exactly. And what it is, is it's a, it's a, a really important Dharma talk and it's Ananda, but it's a really interesting thing because basically what the end, kind of the end message is, if you want to get liberated, you need to want to be liberated. You need to desire that because if you don't, if you're all bound up, tied up by something, if you don't want to get out of that bondage, <laughs> there, you won't get out of the bondage. You have to want it. Now, once you're liberated, will you still want to be liberated? No. And the, so this becomes the really important question. Now, so I want to, again, I'm going to talk about the difference between tanha, craving, and chandra, this desire. And again, the sutra that I'm referencing with Ananda and the Brahmin, it points out clearly that no, 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 no. Chandra is not the problem. It's what you desire. That's the problem. And so one of the hindrances, so one of the five nivarana, one of the five hindrances, number one, is kama chandra. The desire, the chandra for sensual pleasure. So the problem is, is that you are desiring kama or sensuality, or sexuality. In other words, there, you need to have bodhi chandra, awakening chandra, the desire for awakening. You got to have that. Otherwise, you won't be able to get awakened in that way. Now, this sutra, the sutra that we've been reading tonight, has been about the destruction of tanha. Craving is never beneficial. Tanha, which again, if I didn't mention it earlier, tanha is about, the word means thirst. It's this, this kind of, you know, craving versus desiring. And at this point, you know, semantics become important. And what I mean by that is, is that all of these English words we're using are tricky, meaning that, you know, the, the word desire in English is a loaded term. It kind of already has a sort of connotation to it. But I just want to point out that in the Buddhist tradition, they have two different words, tanha and chandra. And this sutra is about destroying tanha and the basic idea of tanha, that's the, um, this craving. And it's kind of one of those things that I feel personally like only the individual knows if what they're doing is craving or sort of wanting in that way. Craving, tanha, again, it's being thirsty. Tanha, of course, is much more desperate. It's very desperate in terms of its needing and wanting in that sense. And it's kind of basically, of course, ultimately agitating in that way. Whereas 
Chandra, it depends. It depends upon what exactly you are going after in that way. Okay, I'm going to get back to the Bodhisattva now, but any questions about the Riddhipada section that I just brought up? Again, this wasn't about that, so let me check out Robin's comment real quick because I love Houston Smith. All right. So this is, so Robin's uh, comment, this is a, it's a big topic. So yeah, it's a huge topic because we'd have to talk about two things first. So Robin's uh, question or comment was about the role of miracles and supernatural powers in Buddhism. And if I read her, her comment correctly, it's sort of about how it's kind of well known that within the world of Buddhism, there's kind of like rules against not performing supernatural powers and kind of keeping that all kind of hush hush and kind of a secret in that way. And at least as far as some of the sutras go, it's the Buddha that gives Magulyayana permission to perform miracles. In, in the shaking of the mansion one in particular, he gives him permission to use the supernatural powers to then stir up a sense of urgency. He didn't really get the Buddha's permission in tonight's sutra, which shows that it's not a requisite. But we would kind of have to talk about two things to address the supernatural powers thing. We would need to address the kind of like taking them literally versus taking them kind of figuratively in that way. For example, just for example, one of the supernatural powers is that a practitioner who has developed this supernatural power can fly up and stroke the sun and the moon. What does it mean to be able to fly up and stroke the sun and the moon with your hand? Well, you could take that literally literally Superman style, flying up and touching the sun and the moon, not getting burned, I guess, and all of that. So you could take it literally, or you could kind of take it figuratively regarding a certain state of liberation that is so liberated, it's as if you can stroke the sun and the moon with your hand. And so we use that analogously or figuratively. So we would sort of need to first understand what what we think supernatural powers are to begin with. And then we could start discussing sort of their role in the world of Buddhism. They are usually strictly for upaya. And by upaya, it's sort of like tonight, either stirring up a sense of urgency or in some traditions I've read about There is a basic idea where it's like, it's basically, it it looks something like this. I, I roll into a village and I tell everybody in the village, I've got the Dharma, I've got the teachings and I could, you know, alleviate all your anxieties. And it's sort of like, eh, whatever. I don't know. You know, people are like, whatever, happy with their anxieties or whatever. And so you think, wow, these people, they don't, they don't want to stop their suffering. Huh? Oh, I know. And then the practitioner would levitate. And all of a sudden, everybody would gather around and they would say, Ooh, how did you do that? And the the monk or whoever would say, well, I'll teach you. You just have to stop killing, stealing, lying, (laughs) meditate a bunch, and basically lead this eightfold path. So in other words, you know, 
it can it is described as a way of tricking people into getting excited about the dharma only to say yeah and the way that you do that is by being a good buddhist in that sense so so marty or sorry robin i don't know if that totally addressed everything cool all right so i want to say my last bit about the bodhisattva path here and basically what it is is that i wanted to address if we go back, I want to address the kind of the, well, again, what I'm basically kind of calling a teaching of apathy. And I want to address that, which is, first of all, again, I want to recognize that that is more or less what the sutra tonight is teaching us. The, the benefit of apathy in that sense. Now, what I want to do in talking about the Bodhisattva path is I want to make clear to everybody that there's a whole giant world of Buddhism, the Mahayana tradition, that has a problem with this teaching of, of extreme apathy. And again, that type of Buddhism is this Bodhisattva path. And what I want to kind of break down for you really quickly because I find it so interesting. I, I find this fascinating. So there is a kind of a an, 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 an equation. It's a a karmic equation, almost like a math equation. And what it is is there is this cyclical process, of being born, craving and clinging to the things of the world, and clinging and craving to them so much that when you die, you basically jump right back in as quickly as possible to try to get more. That's the Buddhist view of reincarnation. It's not that you are being punished for your past actions. You're actually getting exactly what you want in that way. Meaning that you wanted to come right back into this. You were kind of so attached to it in that way. What I'm getting at is that, is that from a Buddhist point of view, it is our, our craving, our tanha, and our upadana our clinging, our attachment, it is the clinging and the attachment and the craving that actually perpetuates the cyclical process of birth, death, and rebirth known as samsara. What that means is, if you can stop clinging, stop needing, stop the craving in that way, when you reach a point of absolute not clinging to anything, there is no longer the karmic fuel to bring you back into samsara. That's what they mean at the end of this when they talk about um, when they talk about and the per and the practitioner understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming to any state of existence. That's talking about how because the craving, the karma of craving has been eradicated, there's no more fuel to put you back into samsara. And that's called moksha or mukti, liberation. It's called nirvana. What happens is, is that from the Mahayana point of view, from the Bodhisattva point of view, the Bodhisattva, and just hear me out on this if you haven't heard it like this before, the Bodhisattva makes a vow to keep coming back into samsara lifetime after lifetime after lifetime until all sentient beings are liberated. But you know what that means? It means the bodhisattva needs karmic fuel to keep coming back into samsara. 
And so bodhisattvas still have chandra. They still have desire. But what do they desire? The liberation of all sentient beings. I call this a dharma loophole. And the dharma loophole is that the bodhisattva uses their desire to help everybody as their karmic fuel for coming back into samsara. And from the Mahayana point of view, what they say is, they say, oh, those poor arhats. They dried up their pool of desire and they don't get to come back and help anybody anymore. It's great that they've helped themselves, but they've cut themselves off from helping anybody else. So that's my little like summary of the what makes Mahayana and the Bodhisattva path what it is. It's about this interesting relationship to karma, desire, and rebirth, frankly, in that way. And again, using this kind of Dharma loophole in that way. Questions about the Bodhisattva path versus uh, Hinayana or anything I've brought up? Yeah, Maria. Hi. Um, so, um, so the Arhat uh, doesn't get reborn into samsara, but what happens? Do they their karmic does their karmic stream just sort of dissolve into the oneness of everything, or they're born in a, a another realm or how does that work well i'll tell you so the truth the dharma is that there is no self it is already the case that there is no self so an arhat is somebody who has come to that realization, which is already the case. The rest of us haven't fully figured that out yet. <laughs> and that's what's perpetuating this thing we call our lives. So my point is, is that there, <clears throat> and this comes back to the tricky thing about Buddhism, which is that there is reincarnation but nothing that is reincarnated. The delusion or the ignorance is thinking I'm being reincarnated. And arhats don't think that way anymore. So they, all, they know that nothing is coming back, whereas we think there is something coming back. Just to put it, yeah, yeah. So they're not um, they're not generating karmic fuel to come back to samsara, um, and so is it is it more like sort of like a vapor trail of karma? It just kind of fades out with them. So, since we have a moment, and this is such a good question, Maria, let me let me kind of. Ex or I'm going to try to explain it the way I understand it. So I've given this example of, I don't know if I've given this, ex actually, if I've ever said this in Dharmador, so this will be interesting. So imagine where you are, or, you know, just in your mind or whatever, but imagine that there's a uh, an oscillating fan, say an oscillating fan in your room that's blowing, right? And let's say that that fan is blowing these curtains on these, there's these windows and the curtains are being blown open and closed by the wind. And let's say there's a, the door to the room is also being kind of swung open and closed as the fan vacillates back and forth. So it's creating this movement and there's this opening and this closing, right? If you were in that room, 
would you think that you were in the body of a creature or a being? Well, but, you know, there's movement of air in and out, and there's the opening and the closing of these windows, and there's the opening and the closing of this door. So there's this movement, but is all that movement and the windows and the doors, is it all a creature or a being? I know that we could imagine it as a creature or a being, because we have great imaginations in that sense. But what I'm getting at to address Maria's comment or question, I want you to notice the way that all of that activity, meaning the fan and the curtains and the opening and the closing, it's all a bunch of disparate activity that a particular discriminating mind can kind of hold together as all being the activity of one being. Well, regarding karma, I do this funny thing where if I go, I think I did that. But if all of a sudden the computer goes beep, 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 I don't think I did that. But why do I think karma, it kind of is here, but not that? Why do I claim ownership over this, but I don't claim ownership over that? What I'm getting at is, is that it is arbitrary where the mind decides karma begins and ends, but arbitrary or not, clinging to a karmic source creates karmic boundaries that are not true, but they're the karmic boundaries that we live by regarding what we think I did versus what I think it didn't have anything to do with me. When, when in actuality, the, the beeping of the computer isn't caused by the computer or by me. That noise is not being caused by me or the hand. It has no cause in that sense. But what I want you to notice is, is that there's a mind that can ascribe causation. So Maria, this karma question is tricky. And I know that I've given you a few different examples there, but I hope you can see that I'm like pointing at this, the lines of karma, the delineated lines of karma that aren't actually there. But they are there when we're clinging to them as such. Yeah. What, what? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the question that is coming up is so what continues? when the energy is i mean can you think of karma as energy what is it that you know is generated and goes um well, back into samsara uh, so and well, allow yeah. me to, allow me to demonstrate this is another one i haven't done this this will be a good uh a good uh closer here. Well, the only thing I other, yeah. other thing I wanted to say is, uh, is it kind of like kinetic energy? There's no so energy. Like a... Okay. Okay. And let me, I want to show you. Okay. So you, again, you may not have seen this one before. So what it is, is let me get my prop. Boom. There it is. So behold, before you, a fist. Now, Maria, you might not, not have ever seen my magic trick, but my magic trick looks like this. I'm going to put the fist, I'm going to put the fist right in my pocket. Oh, where did the fist go? Like, are there traces? Are there energetic traces of the fist left over? Like, where did it go? Oh, is it in my pocket? 
And what we realize is, oh, the fist didn't go anywhere because there kind of never was a fist. And what I mean by that is, is that notice that all of the constituent elements of the fist, notice that they're all still here, but there's no fist here. It shows you that the fist isn't over here. Now, this is my magic trick though. This one represents rupa, physical form or matter. And this one represents sensations, perceptions, conditioning, and consciousness. You know what that is? A self. Does the self exist? It exists the same way my fist exists. We're, we're talking about it. There's agreement. There's a phenomena. But watch. Did, did the fist get reincarnated? Oh, there just never was a fist. But there, and this is where it, the, the teaching of no self is tricky because there is a fist, but there's not. And when I do this, it reveals that it didn't have the svabhava of a fist. When the five aggregates break apart, it's not that the self goes anywhere. Just like when the fist breaks apart, the fist doesn't fly off in some other direction. The self is exactly like that. And so now think about these questions about energetic traces. Energetic traces of what? That's the idea. So what's past karma? What's ca exhausting karma? What's getting exhausted? Ignorance. Ignorance. It's just <laughs> ignorance. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to think about it more because uh, that's a solution. lot of questions are coming up right now. We're at the end that's of the time. That's probably good. That's probably good. All right, everybody, let's end it there. <laughs> we're going to pick back up. By the way, next week, we're going to do the longer discourse on the destruction of craving. And it's actually a discourse about dependent origination. So this conversation is going to continue next Sunday. Stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm.